considering how obsessed I am with regular crochet, I'm like, yeah. I've never heard of this before. No one's talking about this. Like, okay, I will I will become the, the de facto ambassador of Tunisian crochet because I feel like this needs to be part of the conversation. Hello and welcome to the Yarn Over podcast. I am your host, Sarah Jane, and today we're going to be talking to Tony Lipsy from TL Yarn Crafts. Tony is a crochet designer and instructor, and she encourages everybody to flex their creative side and delivers modern crochet patterns, which are accessible for all. She is also the queen of Tunisian crochet, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's dive into this week's episode where we talk about all things Tunisian crochet and more. Have you heard the news? My How to Crochet Handy Reference Guide has had a revamp. This 26 page ebook with exclusive video instructions is perfect for beginners or those who love to have all the information at their fingertips. Get yours now at www.bellacococrochet.com forward slash ebook. Hello, Tony. Welcome to the Yarn Over podcast. I am so excited to have you here. I've been Ever since we planned this, I've been thinking about it the whole time because I just couldn't wait to sit down and have a chat to you. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, Sarah Jane. I've been looking forward to this as well. Like, it's the only thing on my calendar today. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Oh, how amazing. And now, I'm sure everybody knows who you are. But for those who don't, <laughs> can you give a brief introduction? Yes, my pleasure. So my name is Tony Lipsy. I'm the crochet designer and educator and now author behind TO Yarn Crafts. I've been running my business since 2013, full time since 2017. And my main focus is um, designing crochet pieces as well as teaching crochet techniques and uh, reviewing products and, and having a lot of fun just getting people excited about crochet. That's what I do. Yeah. And do you know what? Your excitement is so infectious. Like whenever you're, whenever I'm watching one of your videos, I'm like, oh, I just get so excited by it. So you've just got such an amazing, you know, big personality. You just, oh, yeah. yeah. I can't oh. get enough of you, Tony. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, when you find something that you love this much, like I'm, when I say I'm obsessed with yarn, I don't think people completely get it. Like it's, it's, <laughs> was a huge hobby for me for a while and now it's what I do professionally but it's still very much a hobby so yeah and that that excitement is very genuine because a lot of the things that I'm talking about I'm discovering for the very first time as well so yeah you know, it's easy to get that excited when you're when you're constantly exploring new things within the same kind of niche it's fun yeah yeah, yeah. so how did you actually start crocheting like when was that and you know how did you get into it Sure. Yeah. I always love telling the story because I get to talk about my mom. She's my favorite. Oh. <laughs> so I to crochet from my mom when I was a teen. Um, I was home over a summer vacation. Uh, my brothers were out of town kind of doing their thing for the summer. And I think I was just kind of driving my mom crazy. I was, I was a bit, you know, stir crazy, kind of nothing to do, a little bit aimless. Um, so my mom, who's amazingly crafty, she knits, she crochets, she sews, she just does everything. Yeah. Um, I think just as a way to give me something to do, she started a granny square, like very, very small, and kind of showed me how to keep going with it. Um, so that's what I did over the course of that summer. I made this huge, hideous camouflage blanket. Um, mm -hmm. For folks in the States, they probably know exactly which yarn I'm talking about because uh, it's still in production right now. Um, and so that's kind of when I when I learned. I didn't stick with crochet after that summer. I mean, I was a teenager, so I went on to do teenagery things. Yeah. Um, but I did hold on to kind of the confidence and the encouragement that I felt from actually creating something. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, I wasn't really active in like sports or the clubs and things. I was a reader. That's what I did for entertainment. So it was the first time that I saw my hands turn one thing into something else. And I was like, yeah, oh, like I'm a little magic. <laughs> That's exciting, you know, so I held on to that. Um, so I think the more interesting part of the story is maybe how I came back to crochet. It was about 10 years later. I was newly married. I had um, just graduated from grad school. I was moving to a new town. Uh, it was 2010 and I couldn't find work. So a lot of things were just unsettled 
for me. And I needed something to kind of be that centering thing, that thing that I can focus on and accomplish something to make me just feel like I'm making some progress. Um, so I wandered into a craft store. It was Michael's, uh, which is just a big box store that we have yeah. here in the States. And um, I ended up in the yarn aisle and you get that feeling of like, this is familiar. This is something I know that I can do. So I ended up grabbing a bunch of crochet hooks, a bunch of yarn that didn't match, like all different weights and dye lots and fibers. <laughs> I mean, it was a mess. Uh, but over the course of that year and through that summer, I retaught myself how to crochet. And that's really when I got back into it. It was like in my early 20s. Oh, so yeah. nice. And you know that story of, you know, when you start out with a granny square, it's yeah. it's a place where so many people do start is a granny square, isn't it? That yeah. That's where I started, really. really? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's it, yeah, it's just amazing where it can take you. And that feeling of, wow, I can actually make something. I can start with this and end up with this. I know. It's, it, it's something that really sits with you because there's like this confidence that builds and it's like, well, what else can I do? You know, like mm -hmm. what other stitches or what other yarns can I try and what other the tools are out there? It was like, that's what planted the seed to be like, this is really something that I can explore. It's so cool to hear that you started with a granny square too. I've yeah. met a lot of other folks with similar stories. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a lot of times when your name is mentioned, people think about Tunisian crochet. Now, I will point out before we move on, we do have very different pronunciations of Tunisian. <laughs> <laughs> So I know a lot of people will be like, huh, what is she saying? That's the British way of saying it, I guess. So we'll just we'll just get that out of the way now. Um, but a lot of people do think of Tunisian crochet when they think of you because you are the queen of Tunisian crochet. I'll that crown, no problem. <laughs> so when so when did that process start? Sure. Yeah, that one I I literally stumbled into. I was at um, a yarn convention in New York. It's a it's a pretty big event called Vogue Knit Live, and they have this giant marketplace where lots of you know large and small companies come to sell their products and yarns and things. And I was there with friends and family. I kind of got separated from them to go to the restroom. And as I was kind of wandering the marketplace to get back to them, I ran into this woman who was sitting outside of. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Malabrigo yarn. Um, but she was sitting outside their booth and she had this massive crochet hook and it was like super long. So I was like, knitting needle, crochet hook? <laughs> like my brain just exploded. And I was like, what is going on here? So I walk up to her and she was gracious enough in all my excitement to calm me down. And she kind of like showed <laughs> me the basic stitches and things and kind of talked to me a little bit about Tunisian crochet and um, kind of the history of it and what you can make with it. And, you know, she was working on a very extreme version of Tunisian crochet. And I think she did that to get people excited and mm -hmm. interested in seeing what was going on. But it was really cool to just kind of sit down and have her attention to learn about this new technique. And considering how obsessed I am with regular crochet, I'm like, yeah, I've never heard of this before. No one's talking about this. Like, okay, I will I will become the the de facto ambassador of Tunisian crochet because I feel like this needs to be part of the conversation. Um, so that's kind of where the motivation to to really start building Tunisian crochet content came from. And also yeah. after I came back from that event. I started looking up like different books and YouTube videos. That's really how I learn. That's always where I start. And there yeah. just wasn't a lot. There wasn't much. And I was like, we got to change this. And I was like, yeah. you know, somebody's got to start the ball rolling. And not to say, of course, that I'm the first person to create content around Tunisian crochet. It just wasn't part of the conversation yeah. once I showed up to the party, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of kind of where it jumped off from. And I'm gr I'm super grateful now to see folks like like you and other designers really getting people educated about Tunisian crochet. Because uh, in my opinion, it's like whoever you learn from, just learn it. It's the best. It's super exciting. So yeah, yeah. that was kind of the catalyst though. Yeah. And it's really nice to see that you've like really perfected your skills in that as well. But for those who, who are like, well, what is Tunisian crochet? What? How would you describe it? 
Sure. Uh, I always consider Tunisian crochet as taking the best of both worlds from traditional crochet and knitting. So essentially to create your stitches, um, you have what's called a forward pass where you're collecting loops onto a crochet hook. So that's the part of it that feels a lot like knitting. You get into this rhythm of having loops under your hand, which we don't typically see in traditional crochet. Um, so mm -hmm. it definitely is, there's a little bit of a learning curve to, to understand how to manipulate your hand a bit. Uh, but traditional crocheters will recognize, you know, that you're working with a crochet hook, that you're, you know, loop, you're actually grabbing your loops as opposed to just pushing a needle through them. Um, mm -hmm. So you really get the mechanics of both crafts, but ultimately yeah. the fabric that you create is completely unique to Tunisian crochet. Yeah. It's the simple stitch creates like these cute little boxes, which I love because they're the perfect canvas for cross stitch and really personalizing things. Yeah. Um, really amazing for color work. Like it's just this, this own little craft that's been sitting over here waiting to be explored. And um, I'm excited to, to just continue to dive deep into it. It's, it's got a lot of similarities to crafts that are out there, but there's a uniqueness that's really exciting to explore. Yeah. Definitely. Now you have your very own Tunisian crochet handbook. <laughs> First of all, congratulations, because I know it's been quite a journey for you, hasn't it, to yeah. get in this book <laughs> into people's hands and into, into people's houses. So, mm -hmm. you know, can you tell us a little bit about that journey and, I, um, yeah. you know, because it has been up and down, hasn't it? It has, it has been. I mean, writing your first book uh, before you know a global pandemic is about to happen is quite an interesting experience. Um, so the Tunisian Crochet Handbook, uh, I, was, I was reached out to by a publisher based in New York. Um, didn't really have a plan to write a book at the time. I was very comfortable just kind of doing what I was doing, designing and making videos and things. Uh, but they reached out and they knew that I had... Uh, some expertise within this idea. They wanted to do more craft books. So they asked if I was interested and I was like, sure, let's try it out. So I started writing and, and kind of getting my ideas down in 2019. Um, and the whole idea was that I was going to get everything sent off to my publisher in 2020. Um, so of course that comes around, everything kind of starts shutting down. People are making a lot of decisions about what their work life looks like. Uh, i Personally, that was kind of an easy transition for me. I was already working from home at the time. Yeah. Um, but getting used to having my husband here. <laughs> yeah. Challenge, um, and especially when I had those really focused writing days, because there are certain days where even though the focus is on this craft of Tunisian crochet, you're spending, you're spending a lot of time in front of a computer and you're yeah. right you're researching. Um so that was uh, that was a very interesting part of that early the early days of that process. But we eventually did get the manuscript done. Everything sent off to the publisher. They took about a year to get everything together. Um, but one of the unfortunate side effects of this pandemic was a lot of slowdowns in supply chains. Everything yeah. from the original paper we picked, we couldn't get the original finish on the cover, wasn't available to us. Once books were actually printed, they were stuck on shipping containers. Um, and then kind of a good problem to have is when we got the first run of the books, they sold out in a month which they wow. did, which my publisher didn't expect. Um, so unfortunately, we had to wait three more months uh, for the second run to even become available. And typically mm -hmm. in publishing, that second run can be available in as short as six weeks. So waiting three months was definitely a side effect of kind of what all is going on with supply chains and things. I learned a lot more about shipping containers and trade routes <laughs> than I thought I would ever know. Um, so that's a nice bit of education that I got. But yeah. After all the bumps, I, like everybody's been really, really amazing and super patient um, mm -hmm. while we were getting this out. And I mean, it's my first book. So of course I, I talk about it every five minutes. So keeping that momentum and keeping that excitement up has been pretty easy for me. Um, yeah. And my audience, thankfully, has braved this storm with me. So yeah. now that the book is is on shelves and available pretty readily from, from online and in-person retailers, it's been a lot easier to kind of talk about it and make sure folks can get their hands on it too. Yeah, it is. It is such a beautiful book. I was so excited when it landed on my doorstep and you have some amazing projects in there as well. Mm -hmm. The photography is gorgeous as well. I mean, all of your product photography is always like spot on. Did you, were you involved much in all of that? 
Oh, 100 percent. I, I yeah. had my hands all over everything visual in this book. And the visuals within my brand have always been really important to me because I'm working off this philosophy that you eat with your eyes first, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're approaching a craft that you're not quite sure about or you are just open to lots of different ideas, when you see something beautiful, it can start to draw you in. And then once I've kind of got you hooked by all these pretty pictures, I then kind of dive into the tutorials, into the actual patterns, and people find that they're a lot more accessible and they're a lot easier than, you know, sometimes this technique can seem. Um, yeah. So yeah, the 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 visuals and the the photography was was very much a big part of putting this together. I have to give a lot of love to um, Allie, who took my photos, and also my two models. Um, these are folks that I've worked with before. You know, people who've been following TL Yarncrafts for a while have seen these faces. Yeah, it was super important to me to have not only familiar faces, but but women of color, especially involved in this project, um, because you know, just there's not a lot of folks that look like me in this industry. So I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm going to put something, a physical book out there that's going to last forever. I want to make sure that I feel represented in other people who crochet, who are, who are black or brown or anything in between feel like they have a place in this industry as well. There was a yeah. lot of, a lot of forethought went into that and in, in making sure that we showed up beautifully and excited about this craft. Like it was yeah. all extremely intentional. Yeah, it's amazing. And it was really nice to see, like you say, familiar faces, because I am used to seeing, um, I don't know their names, but I feel like I know them because I see yeah, them yeah. so many times. Yeah, um, I, I consider like like Janine is on the cover and then Shayra, who's been with TL Yarncrafts like since the beginning. Like yeah. I would, I having that continuity from, you know, the branding that I use on my website or the posts that I put on Instagram all the way into this book, I wanted people to know that this was a Tony Lipsy book, a T.O. Yarncraft book, even if my name wasn't on the cover. That's mm -hmm. always super important to me. And I feel like we accomplished that with this book by having enough of like my hands in the photo and my little mole on my finger. People say they recognize it. And I'm yeah. like, I want you to feel like you're coming into this safe, comfortable place that you've been before to yeah. learn something new. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Wow, yeah. that's lovely. Um, so if you were to give some um, tips then, what's your three top tips if oh. people were learning um, Tunisian crochet? Sure. I would say my first tip is to start with quality tools. Yeah. Um, I found whether you're knitting, crocheting, Tunisian crochet, especially having good tools is super important because if you've got like a wood hook with splinters in it and it's mm -hmm. snagging the yarn, you might feel like it's something you're doing wrong when in mm -hmm. all actuality, it's your tools kind of holding you back. Yeah. So I think that's really important. It's like, you don't necessarily have to invest, you know, hundreds of dollars into your tools, but having a good quality hook, at least to learn with is really important. Mm -hmm. um, my second tip is not to feel like you have to start with a pot holder or a cup cozy or, you know, these smaller projects. I think we all have different motivations when mm -hmm. we go into making projects. So somebody might want to make a wearable, a big chunky oversized cardigan. And I'm like, you can absolutely do that as your first project. If you're feeling the motivation, you've got the yarn for it, go for it. If you're more comfortable starting in that beginner space of a pot holder or cup cozy, there's no wrong answers here. So there's not any particular way that these things have to be done. Go mm -hmm. into your journey in whatever direction you want. Yeah. Uh, and then my last piece of advice is not to be afraid to ask questions. You know, I yeah. think well, people know that you and I, we're real people and we have either ourselves or folks working behind the scenes who are ready to answer questions for folks who get stuck. Uh, I get a lot of my tutorial video ideas from the questions that I receive because I figure if one person has this question, there's probably dozens more who yeah. also would like to know. So don't be afraid to reach out to, you know, the, the different folks or resources that are available to you to get your questions answered. Uh, there are a lot of really, really nice people in this industry who just want to see you succeed. So don't yeah. be afraid to ask. Yeah, we all want to recruit more crochets, yeah. don't we? Come on in. Like, it's a nice place to be. All of this, right, is like to get <laughs> people excited and motivated and really confident about their their skills in crochet, even from the very beginning, because that's what makes you interested in learning the next step. Mm -hmm. build onto that other thing and being a bit more adventurous. Once you tackle those basic skills, you're like, okay, what can I do next? And and that's yeah. 
that's the kind of people that I, that I would love to have uh, within this maker community because that's what continues to push this craft forward. I think people just being super excited to try new things. Yeah, definitely. Now, I know you said that, you know, to be inspired, like do whatever you're inspired by. If you are just learning out and you want to make a sweater or it doesn't matter what the project is, but if somebody wanted to be guided, they're like, please just tell me where to start. (laughs) Just tell me. Uh, What would you say is a really good project to start with? Sure. Uh, if I could, I will show you the one in my in my book that I always recommend to folks. Of to start course. With. They're called the Geo Pot Holder. So it's this double thick pot holder. It's these guys right here. Mm-hmm. It's double thick pot holder. It's made from cotton. And I love that as a beginner project because you get to practice the basic stitches. It uses a simple stitch, um, which is which I equate to like the knit stitch or the single crochet. It's like that first stitch that you learn. Um, and you get to practice that technique for the entirety of the project. Since you're making two identical squares, you get to practice the foundation row. You get to practice that simple stitch, the bind off. But then there's also kind of other exciting and fun parts to this project. Project. Um, so there's like a little grid that you'll cross stitch onto the project. You're adding a little loop. You're doing this embroidery technique to join the two squares together. So you've got this finished usable thing, but you've also practiced all of these skills. But it doesn't yeah. have like this big overwhelming thing because I mean it's like eight inches square. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a really great place to start. And I and I definitely recognize that there are folks out there that are like, what's step one? What's step two? What's yeah. step three? And I try my best to cater to those folks as well. Because some people want a little bit more guidance yeah. in this craft. And some folks are totally confident going out on their own. Um, so, yeah, I think the geo pot holder is a great place to start. Yeah. And I love that. I, I always love to um, see projects where, or in myself, if I'm designing something or creating something, is them going on that um, journey almost of, yeah. you know, practicing because uh, tension tension's a big thing anyway in crochet when you begin but I think particularly with Tunisian crochet it's something even the most skilled of regular crocheters have to have to uh, work on isn't it absolutely I completely agree I I was working on a blanket project just this morning and it's a nice little chevron but with all those peaks and valleys sometimes I have to adjust the yarn on my hand um so I, I love that this uh, observation because it's a reminder that even even though I have the skills to do Tunisian crochet, like when I'm working on my projects, I have to make adjustments. You know, it's based on the yarn. It's based on my tools and the pattern. You might have to hold the yarn slightly differently or tug on your loops a little bit different. So mm-hmm. making those adjustments is definitely part of the process. And it's important for folks to know that too. Yeah. yeah I think that's one of my favorite things about crochet is that it's always a learning process. There's always something new to learn, um, whether it's something about yourself personally mm-hmm. or, you know, a new technique that you've learned from somebody else. There's always something out there that you can, you know, add to your skill set, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's what keeps it so exciting for me and, and probably the reason why I spend so much time in Tunisian crochet, because there's so much that we haven't tackled yet. Like, you know, getting deeper into Tunisian crochet cables or playing around with color work or doing like three-dimensional stitching in Tunisian crochet. There's a lot of techniques that are found in other crafts that maybe haven't been like honed to that fine point in Tunisian crochet. And that's the part that gets me really excited because I'm like, you know, all right, we've tackled this over here. So what's next? Mm -hmm. Um, Just kind of playing around with those new ideas is what keeps it fresh and what keeps Mm -hmm. it exciting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for those who um, have maybe already dabbled a little bit into the Zing Crochet, have you got any uh, more challenging patterns that you think they could try? Because sometimes it's nice to actually push yourself out of that comfort zone, isn't it? And uh, yeah. challenge yourself a bit more. Yeah, I think um, like a lot of what I focus on within my design style is those beginner level patterns and always encouraging people like there's no set level that is a beginner. There, of course, mm-hmm. are techniques that we would consider beginner intermediate. Um, But just because you're just starting out doesn't mean you can't do an intermediate project. Uh, But if folks are starting with the geo pot holder, for example, and want to step it up, I would recommend my Loveland shawl. 
Um, so that was a Tunisian crochet triangle scarf that I made in collaboration with Hugh Loco a couple years ago. And that one uses a lot of different and fun techniques. So it uses the Tunisian knit stitch. There are some increased stitches in there that are really fun to play around with. It works with color work. There's also a really fun mesh stitch and a couple of different stitches and techniques that kind of push your boundaries just a little bit. And the whole idea is to just start accumulating these techniques that you can put into your toolkit. So as you continue to find new patterns, you're like, oh, I've done that before. So I can make this or I've tried yeah. that. So I feel more confident to make this. So I think that's definitely a good next step. So going from a pot holder to a shawl, it's like a comfortable next level, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you say, you know, just because you're a beginner doesn't mean that you can't do something intermediate because I get asked so many times, is this pattern suitable for beginners? And my reply is always the same give it a go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What's the worst that can happen? You have to want yeah. to do it. <laughs> exactly. And that not that the joy of crochet though? It's so forgiving. And it's like, yeah. even if you buy yarn for a particular project, you try it out today, maybe it doesn't work. I've literally heard people say, I tried this technique last year or a week ago or a month ago, and I tried it today and it just clicked. Like something just clicked today. And I'm like, that's that's the thing that I love about crochet. It's like once it clicks, it's like, oh, I got it. That makes total sense. And that might happen for a beginner project and it might happen for an intermediate project, no matter where you are on your journey. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that's amazing advice. Just give it a go and, yeah. see, and see how it works out. Yeah. I'm curious. Do you have any completely, like completely, completely, <laughs> complete disasters Oh. in like any projects that you just thought wow <laughs> that did not go the way I planned um you know what if I have it was totally user error I have um one piece that I can remember especially is I was working with this gorgeous like Aaron weight chain at yarn that was still really new to me I yeah. wasn't familiar with how stretchy it was or you know how it would change with blocking I made this entire top and as I looked at it I'm like something about this feels off but I'm going to go with it anyway. I took it to the photo shoot, had my model put it on and like, she couldn't get it over her arms. The neck hole wasn't big enough. Like it's those kind of things where it's like the garment could have worked, but yeah. I wasn't familiar enough with my materials and I wasn't, you know, paying close enough attention to some of the measurements. Um, so that was a learning experience for me, for sure, to, you know, swatch better, play around with my materials before I just jump right into a design. Um, yeah. But I mean, I'm constantly learning. I'm, I'm running this business for the most part by myself. So I'm self-taught in a lot of things. And uh, a lot of my successes have come from a string of failures. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, but it's practice. You know, that's, yes. that's how you grow in anything, whether it's the design side or, you know, producing video or doing, you know, in-person teaching even. Like you have to try things and experiment before you can kind of hit your stride. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that I'm constantly going through. And so I, I always try to encourage people who are learning traditional or Tunisian crochet. It's all about the practice. Like you have some people end up having to practice a little bit longer than others. But eventually I do feel like everybody can get it. Like it'll click for you at some point if you just put the time in. Yeah. Yeah, they'll have that aha moment, like, and, and the, the sense of accomplishment once you've actually made something is just, I, I'm sure you do too, but I get so many, like, photos sent to me, look what I made, I'm like, yay! I'm so proud of themselves, which makes me proud, because I'm like, yes, look at you go, like, I'm just yeah. excited what they're going to do next. Um, yeah. I love getting those emails. I actually sent, I set up a little folder in my Gmail called kind notes. So oh, like that's email nice. that I get from people about like, you know, I made this project for this person or I tried this technique for the first time. And I just, I, I always go back to those like on days where I'm feeling a little less motivated or yeah. you know, a little stressed out. I'm like, here's a reminder of the folks that I'm doing this for. And again, if there's one person who's feeling super confident and excited about something they learned from a tutorial, there's probably dozens of other folks that are feeling similarly and lots of people who are coming up behind them who are trying to learn something as well. So mm -hmm. 
keeps me motivated, keeps me, keeps me focused on why I'm doing all of this. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of that, you always seem like you're doing so much. I am absolutely in awe of you. (laughs) Your organization skills are absolutely insane. And how you bring out so many projects in such a short space of time. And you work really far in advance, don't you? I do. Yeah. Usually like about six to eight months, typically. I try at least because that's that's what keeps the pressure and the stress off of me. Like knowing what's coming down the pipeline helps me a lot. Like I'm working on projects right now that probably won't come out till like late summer or even the fall. Um, So it's that really helps me to stay organized. If I work too close to deadlines, inevitably something has to come off of my plate so I can really hone in. So, you know, there's definitely certain places within my business. So like my video production, I can do that a day or two before it's due. Mm -hmm. But like pattern design, I know myself well enough that I need to be working in advance to keep it all And do you have to like make loads of notes of that design? Because if you're anything like me, I would have forgot (laughs) what I did two weeks ago, let alone six months ago. Yeah, I what I try to do is I try to complete all the steps of that design at once. So, yeah, I know if I've got a project that's coming out six months from now, I won't necessarily like make the sample now and then wait and write the pattern because then I'm yeah. going to start forgetting things. I'm like, wait, what did, what did I do? And I'm like picking apart the garment to try to figure out what I did. Yeah. Um, but I try to accomplish as much as I can right up front. Uh, and then, you know, maybe the photo shoot's going to be a little bit later or I send it to tech editing a little bit later. Um, but I do the bulk of the work right up front just to have it done and kind of out of the way. And that clears my mind, clears my schedule to do all the other little things that I can yeah. Queen. Yeah. Well, seems as you're so well planned, <laughs> can you tell us what's coming up for you for the rest of the year? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the really fun thing that's happening soon is I'm doing a um, Tunisian handbook tour, a little virtual tour. Um, I've been able to bring in some of my amazing Tunisian crocheter friends uh, to help me promote the book, but also to show how many people are actually doing Tunisian crochet out yeah. there. I, I love being one of the faces of this craft, but there are so many amazingly talented people out there who are doing this as well. So I really want to shine a light on them. So that'll be coming up uh, starting in mid-April. And then summer, uh, my birthday is in June. So I always try to do something fun. So I'm doing the hashtag yarn love challenge. Uh, It's uh, it's a photo challenge and crochet along. So each day there's going to be some prompts. And you'll start a project at the beginning of the year, kind of share about it each, uh, not at the beginning, of the, at the beginning of the month, rather. And then mm-hmm. you'll share it um, a few times over the course of that month. And then by the end of the month, hopefully you'll have a finished project um, and lots of really great photos and reels and things on your Instagram feed. So really looking forward to that as well. That sounds so fun. Now, as I say, I'm sure people know you already, but where can they find you if they don't? (laughs) So they can head across, because if you don't know, you need to go across immediately. Find Tony (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) Um, Well, I've tried to keep it very easy. It's all, it's at TL Yarn Crafts everywhere. So that's Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, TL Yarn Crafts.com. Like it's, it's just TL Yarn Crafts all over the internet. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Just to remind everyone, go and get your Tunisian Crochet Handbook because it is absolutely gorgeous. Congratulations again. Thank you so much for all your little nuggets of wisdom. Um, It's been fabulous to have you. Thanks for having me, Sarah Jane. I appreciate it so much. So much. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you.